Senate. Um, Sherry Morgan made it in tonight. She had some work done on the knee, had some cartilage cleaned up, a, I think a ligament repaired a little bit, and bone spurs cleaned out. And I don't know what all. You know when you get old, all kinds of stuff starts happening. Trust me, I know if you see me limping around, y'all ever get where your ankle feels like it needs to pop, but it won't pop, and it hurts like crazy when you go up on the ball of your foot? Am I the only one that experiences that? Okay, good, because mine's been doing it all afternoon, my right one, and Sunday it was my left one. So, anyway, and so I think that's called old age. That's what that is. But Sherry's doing well. She's uh, recuperating from that and walking pretty, actually better than I thought she would be by this point. Because, you know, you read all about all these athletes, how they, they'll have their knee, they'll have an arthroscopic sort of procedure done on their knee, and three weeks, six weeks later, they're out there, you know, playing professional football again. For real people, it doesn't work that way most of the time. You can walk in a couple of days, but if it's like me, when I had mine done, you start walking and you feel like your knee is liable to bend backwards just as it is the right way. And uh, anyway, she's doing great. Um, and her grandson, uh, is, he, he, we mentioned Sunday, was diagnosed the problem is colitis. The treatment is an IV type treatment that he'll do every couple of weeks or so for a few months or something like that and try to get that straightened out and then if they can get that where he's just pretty much raw inside, they can get that settled down, then I guess they'll look at a long term how to control this thing. But that's that's where he is. Um, Joan Powell is still, as far as I know, at room 119 at River City. And uh, <clears throat> so she's over there. Who am I leaving out? I feel like there's somebody I'm not thinking about. Anybody, we, anybody else have any one you want to add to the prayer list that you know of? All right. Well, let's. Yep. Four of the kids that were injured were members of the church. Because a friend of mine, their husband, preaches at Paducah. Several of the kids were airlifted to Paducah. There's about four of them that were more serious. They were airlifted to Vanderbilt. Nineteen were shot. Two have passed away. One of the members of the church is one of the ones at Vanderbilt. They think they're all going to make it at this point, but they don't know for sure. And uh, one of the members of the church that was taken to the hospital, he wasn't shot. He was trampled when everybody was trying to run away. But now he went and got treated and was released pretty quickly. But yeah, 19 kids were shot, apparently, that we know of. Two have passed away. A 15-year-old boy with a handgun. Say so what now? Who does? Oh, really? Well, from Elizabethtown, I know. I'm not sure about... Oh, okay. Yeah. Really? Okay. Well, what I've gotten from talking to Elizabeth up there and then just reading on the Internet, too, is a 15-year-old boy... Apparently, his father passed away not that long ago. Uh, they think that probably he was abused by his dad for a number of years, and his father passed away, and he was having a real hard time with that. His mother blamed him for his father dying. Obviously, as a 15-year-old, you're going to have trouble with that. And when he posted something about how he was struggling with his dad's death on Snapchat, Apparently, some of the kids from school posted, you know, suck it up. You know, quit being a baby. Get over it. Well, so he was kind of bullied a little bit. And well, they don't know, but it sounds like that's probably he just snapped and said, I'll just take it out on anybody at school.
Right. Yeah. Okay. That's Mike's cousin Dylan. So it just Okay. And uh anyone else? And one thing I didn't real I didn't remember, but apparently these mass shootings in schools, the first one you know that we was in Paducah, Kentucky, back in night it was before Columbine. A guy, uh, one of the kids came in and shot a bunch of people. And, of course, Columbine's the first one I remember, but I didn't realize that. But, yeah, you know, so, anyway. All right, anything else? Okay, let's have a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the day you've given us and for all the blessings that you give us each day. We ask you to be the folks that have been mentioned, be with those that, that need our, our prayers. We're thankful Sherry's doing as well as she is. We pray that you'll be with with their grandson as he continues to battle this colitis and that the treatment he's receiving will work and that this can be controlled over a period of time. And we ask you to be with Joan Powell as she's in, in rehab and experiencing some other issues. Father, we just pray that she can find healing and comfort and peace. And we pray that you be with Mike's cousin Dylan as he's battling with a, a difficult addiction or drug problem and we're thankful that his life could be saved and we pray that as he recovers from this particular incident that that in fact he will be willing and able to find and seek out help and take advantage of the opportunities that are given to him and father we ask you to be with the folks up in Kentucky that the families that have lost a couple of their children and and others that are injured and hurting and scared and and father we just pray that you'll somehow be with them and that through tragedy like this somehow that perhaps someone could turn closer to you and actually be brought to you as a result of, of this kind of difficulty. Father, we ask you to be with us through the rest of this class. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we talked last week about 2 Timothy 2.15. What do that say? What does 2 Timothy 2.15 say? <clears throat> Study. Show yourself proven unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We looked at being a capable workman. We talked last time about what do I study. Obviously, you know, it depends on the kind of knowledge you desire. But if I want to know about it, being a Christian, I've got to study the Bible. And if I want to know specifically about how to become a child of God today, I go to the New Testament because the Old Testament, and we looked at Ephesians 2.15, Colossians 2.14, the handwriting, and then Deuteronomy 9, 10, and Deuteronomy 4, 13, where God literally wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. And those were taken out of the way, having been nailed to the cross. And so we talked about the distinction between the two covenants. And so the New Testament is the guide today for our biblical success. And we may look some more at that um, as time goes by. How do I study? Well, 2 Timothy 2, 15, the newer translations say, give diligence or be diligent, so I diligently study. And that word implies striving, eager, a desire to do and working hard at it. And, uh, you know, and so, <clears throat> as someone has said, the loftiest inquiries after truth terminate in God. And we looked at John 17, 17, where Jesus, in his prayer that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, said, Sanct talking to the Father, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So ultimately, the highest effort to find truth will end in God and His Word, because His Word is truth. Um, we looked at methods of gaining Bible knowledge. That's where we ended up last time, and we talked about three different methods. I can, or I can uh, scan, which is like looking over a few chapters every now and then as I get time. That's better than nothing, but it's pretty weak. We looked at just reading, which is beneficial, beginning at Genesis 1-1 and reading through Revelation 22-18 or 19-18. I forget how many verses are in Revelation 22. Anyway, and uh, 
you know, and reading from beginning to end at 3.26 chapters, three and a quarter chapters a day will uh, do it, or you can read 3.8 chapters a day and take Sundays off, and you'll be through the Bible in a year. So basically, if you just read four chapters a day, you'll be through the Bible in less than a year. So it's not like we're talking about this, you know, insurmountable task that's just impossible, and it's, it's not, you know? And uh, anyway, and then we looked at a third method of gaining Bible knowledge, which is actual study, which is the most beneficial. You know, I, where I do research, I examine Scripture, I investigate, and, you know, and that is very profitable. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. I can do a topical study. If I want to know, what does the Bible say about faith? Well, I'm going to look up all the verses that pertain to faith. And I can do that through a concordance. We're in a concordance. Now, if I'm looking at faith, what's it, what, what would I look up in a concordance? How would a concordance help me if I want to do a biblical study of faith? What would I look up? The word faith. And that concordance, if it's a complete concordance, like Cruden's or Nelson's complete or Strong's, you know, or Young's analytical concordance, Strong's exhaustive concordance, those are the two, you know, benchmarks for generations. It's going to show me, tell me every verse in the Bible, the reference for every verse in the Bible that uses the word faith. And so I can go there. Now, does that mean that? But that may not hit ever because there may be some verses that talk about the concept of faith that don't really have the word faith in them. So if I take in conjunction with a complete concordance, and if I get myself a topical Bible like Orville J. Nave, who put together Nave's topical Bible, and again, that has been the standard for topical Bibles. I don't know. I don't remember when, the early 20th century, I think, maybe the 1920s, something like that. Anyway, when that was done, get a Knave's topical Bible and a complete concordance, and you look up the subject of faith in the topical Bible, it's just like a dictionary, alphabetical order, and it will print out from the King James translation, typically. It will have every verse that talks about faith printed out for you right there. And so any to- I can do a topical study like that, or I can do an expository study. Now, what does that mean? An expository study as opposed to a topical study. Any idea? I take a specific passage and I want to expose what that package, that package, that passage has to say. That's an expo, like we did a couple of Sundays ago from Psalm 51 when we looked at the penitent heart. We took Psalm 51, 1 through 12. And that's what the sermon was on. Didn't really pull in even that many other verses. We did an expository lesson on that passage. Did it not long ago with Psalm 23, the shepherd psalm. Just, you know, so that you take a passage of Scripture. And what would help with that? Not necessarily a concordance, not necessarily a topical Bible, but what would help if I wanted to do research and, and investigation into a particular passage of Scripture. A commentary. Commentaries, now they're written by men, but they bring in a lot of good ideas. Maybe a Bible dictionary that, that kind of can help me with some things. Like, for instance, if I'm studying a passage out of the Old Testament, maybe, and it alludes to something that was, you know, that was a custom of the day, well, if I may not be able to fully grasp it if I don't understand well, what, they're, what are they talking about there. I mean, so I could get a book on customs and manners of Bible times, for instance, in Bible lands. I could get a Bible dictionary that would help me to understand, you know, in Abraham's day, this is how they did things, you know? And so there's all kinds of helps out there. Of course, the main thing is the Word of God. But study is what's most profitable. And as you can imagine, if you do like I'm just talking about, you pull in a concordance, a topical Bible, a commentaries, that takes effort. So... That's right. That's right. That's right. So you go to, you got to, yeah. And that's the thing. You got to get around it and before it and after it. And when you think about studying the context, 
Typically, when somebody talks about you need to get the context of that passage, generally, what are we talking about? Most people. Like, if I want to get the context of Acts 2.38, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at what the few verses before it and, and a few after it, right? So I can kind of set the stage. I can get the context of when Peter said that, what prompted that, who was he talking to, what did, you know. But then there's other times that really, if I want to get the true context of some passages, and I look at it as the context from an entire biblical perspective, I may need to go to several different passages to get the context of what that passage is talking about. But generally, there you go. Generally, when you think, get the, you know, you, and, and what do people say? You took a text out of its context and made it a pretext for whatever you want to believe, and that happens all the time, and that can even happen in the church. We have to be careful about that. But typically, when I think of a context, I'm thinking like maybe the chapter it's in, maybe just two or three verses on each side of it, maybe the book, depending, you know, whatever I have to do to get the full context. But generally, you can get it with the, you know, the verses before and the verses after, because what you want to be able to answer when you're trying to determine the meaning of a passage, you want to be able to answer, you know, who's talking, if somebody's talking, who's talking, who are they talking to, what's the occasion, what brought up the comment, you know, and what's the principle that's being taught, and so on and so on. And you generally, a lot of times, you can't get that just from that one verse. You know, you need to, you, for instance, just like when we quote Acts 2.38, then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, if I want to tell somebody how to become a child of God, and I go to Acts 2.38, what they're going to say is, oh, there's two things I need to do, which would be what? Repent and be baptized. Well, I thought you had to have faith. How come that verse doesn't say anything about faith? Well, because you've got to go back to verse 36 and beyond, where Paul Peter said, this same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. And verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Now why were they cut to the heart? Because they didn't believe him or because they did? Obviously they believed that Jesus was the Son of God or it wouldn't have bothered them at all. And the ones that didn't believe, it didn't bother them. They just went right on. But the ones that believed what Peter said are the ones that asked the question, what must we do to be saved? What must we do? So Peter answered their question from the perspective from whence it was asked. They were already believers at that point in Christ as the Son of God. So he said, here's what you need to do now. Repent and be baptized. Now, it doesn't mention confession. I'm well aware of that. But if you want to get, you know, and there again, if you want to get the context of everything it takes to become a child of God, then you're going to have to go to more than just one passage. And when you put it all together, you come up with, you know, obviously if you don't hear it, it's pointless, and faith and repentance and confession and baptism. And, uh, you know, and that's what you find if you look at the entire context of how to become a Christian. And that's going to be found in various passages. But anyway, that's uh, study. That's the best way. Now, why should I study? Well, according to 2 Timothy 2.15, I study to show myself approved to God, a workman that does not that needs not to be ashamed. And what's the next line? Handling a right or properly dividing the word of truth. I need to study so that I know how to handle the truth. There's a lot of people out there that know the truth, but does it do them any good? No, because it's not handled properly. It's not applied properly. Knowledge is great, but if I don't study enough to have the discernment to know how to deal with the knowledge, then it's not going to do me any good. Hey, Jimmy, after you count us, can you turn the heat off? Thank you. Um, and then it'll be cold within 15 minutes, I know, but hey, you know, we can live with it. I study to fulfill the command to teach. What does Matthew 28, 19 tell us? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. It's Matthew's account of the Great Commission. Jesus said, do what? Doing all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
Well, no, he said, go into all the world and make disciples, whatever, preach, teach, all nations. And then he continues, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do what? Observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all. So I study, because if I don't study God's Word, can I teach God's Word? You can't teach what you don't know. And you're not going to know it if I don't study it. So I study to be a capable workman, to know how to handle the truth. I study so that I can disseminate, so that I can teach the truth. 1 Peter 3.15. Look that one up. 1 Peter 3.15. I'm not going to tell you what they all say. Somebody's going to have to look up every now and then. In fact, off the top of my head right now, I know what it says, and for the life of me, I don't think I can quote it for some reason. Anyway, maybe my brain needs to pop, and it just hasn't popped kind of like my ankle. 1 Peter 3.15, what does it say? All right. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give an answer to those who ask about the hope that's in you, but do it with meekness, submission to God, and fear or reverence for God. In other words, don't do it out of a self-righteous attitude that says, well, it's because I'm so great. Now, the, and the hope that's in me is what? The hope that's in the child of God is what? The hope of what? Hope of heaven. It's that hope, Romans 8 says, in which we live. All right? So when somebody wants to know, how come you know you're going to heaven? What makes you so special? You, you act like you know you're going to heaven. How come you, you feel that way? And they can ask it kind of like that or in a very sincere way. I need to be able to give them an answer. The Bible tells me right there to always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asked a reason for the hope that is in me. So if I have not studied God's Word enough to be able to tell somebody from Scripture why I believe I'm going to heaven, what does that tell me? Maybe I'm not going. It's what it tells me. Because I haven't obeyed the command of God to be ready to give an answer. And folks, that, you, don't, you, don't, that, you don't learn that by osmosis. You can't put the Bible under your pillow at night and wake up in the morning you know, with all this extra knowledge. It, it'd be nice, but it doesn't work that way. It takes diligence. And you, know, you say, well, I kind of know what the... Well, I need to know it well enough to logically explain to somebody that wants to know why I think I'm going to heaven. Doesn't mean I have to quote all the Scriptures, but I need to know what the Scriptures say about getting from earth to heaven so that I can answer somebody. And that's the first thing. We need to know what that hope is that we live in. That's true. It means... Right. D plus E equals H. When we say, whoo, man, I really love that house. I hope we can get that house. Well, that's just a, that's just a desire. That's all that is. But then when you go to the mortgage company... You pre-qualify for the loan, you know you can afford it, and that's the house you want, and you are in the closing attorney's office ready to sign the papers, then you not only desire the house, you expect it. Now that's the hope of the Bible. It's more than just a desire. It is a desirous expectation of heaven. As Paul said, I know whom I have believed. He said, I have a crown of life waiting on me. He desired heaven, and he knew he was going. That's right. And that confidence is what produces peace. And peace is what everybody wants. 1 John 5, 13. I write these things, John said, so that you can know you have eternal life. And you don't have to wonder. You know, how many Christians, boy, I hope I go to heaven. Well, I ought to know. And the thing is, when I know Scripture... I know when I'm going, and I know when I'm not. And that's, you know, and that's just a fact. When I know what I need to do to go to heaven, I know if I'm not doing it, I'm not going. 
but I know that if I'm following God's will and serving Him in love, that I am going. And people say, well, that's awful, you know, judgmental. You know, it's not. It's not judgmental at all. It's just using the brain God gave me and the book He left me so that I can have exactly what He wants me to have. He wants me to know where I'm headed. And He makes that pretty clear in several places in Scripture. But the only way I'm going to know that is to put the time into the book that tells me how to get there. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and He's the only way I'm going to get to heaven, then if He loves me, He's going to tell me how to get there. He's going to tell me how to be in Him and get there by following Him. And He does. That's kind of the purpose of the book. And so, you know, we... Now, what does Matthew 7, 1 say? Judge not that you be not judged. Granted, but keep reading Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Then you look at the next verse. For the same standard with which you judge, you will be judged. So people say, Jesus says you can't judge. No, He doesn't. He says, judge not that you be not judged, for with the same measure you judge, you will be judged. He's telling us you have to make judgments. What He's saying in the first verse is, do not condemn, lest you be condemned. For with the same... I have to make discernments all the time. In fact, the Hebrew writer talks about how that you know the Word of God can separate soul and marrow. It discerns you know, the good from the bad. I've got to make judgments. We do it every single day. You can't survive in life without making judgments. I mean, it happens every day, some big, some small. But I got, and making a judgment is basically making a decision. I have two options. I choose one. Well, that's a judgment. I judged that that one's better than that one, so I chose it. You know, I've got someone out here. I look at God's Word, and I look at my life. You know, what does James 1 tell us? Or what? Is there in verse 22? Do not be hearers, don't be hearers of the Word. Be doers of the Word and not hearers only. And then it goes on to say too many people, you know, it's like looking in a mirror. You read God's Word, you're looking in the mirror, and then when you walk away, you forget what you look like. I have to compare my life to the ideal, to the standard in God's Word. And know where I stand with God. And when I know where I stand, and I know what God asked me to do to get there, then I know what God asked every other human being on the planet to do to get there. Because God is no respecter of persons. So is it judgmental to say, this person is lost? No. Now, if I say it with glee and joy in my heart, ah! You're lost. Well, then I got a problem. Now I'm being condemnatory. I'm like, it's like I'm his judge and jury. No, I'm not. God is. But to use the poor excuse, which is based on nothing but fear, lack of knowledge, and just no desire to do what God says, to say, well, I have no right to try to study with that person because I'm not his judge. Garbage. That's just another way of saying I'm scared to do what God wants. And I don't have enough knowledge to do it. Because if I did, I'd love that guy enough to try to study with him and show him where he's wrong. And more importantly than showing him where he's wrong, showing him what's right. But I cannot possibly be convicted of righteousness until I'm first convinced of what? What's the first thing that has to happen for a person to come to Christ? They have to learn what? That they're not in Christ, right? That's the first thing I've got to figure out. I'm lost. Then I can seek salvation. But if I don't know I'm lost, why would I seek something that I don't believe I need? So that's why Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit, I will send the Comforter, and He will convict the world of two things. You remember what they were? Sin and righteousness. And you notice the order? I've got to be convicted that I'm a sinner before I'll ever be convicted of, to, to be righteous. You know, in, in Paul, when he wrote to the Romans, you know, he talked about how that you were servants of sin. I believe it's in Romans 6, around verse 17 or so. You were servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. That's the way it works. 
If I don't recognize I'm a slave of sin, I will never go through the process that results in being a slave of righteousness. So God's Word not only convicts me of how to be righteous, it tells me when I'm wrong because it tells me what's right, and if I don't measure up, I know I'm wrong. And that is not self-righteous. That is not holier than thou. That is not I'm smarter than you. That has nothing to do with any of it. It's just a fact. You know, it's just a fact. I mean, you go to school. You have, may have a higher IQ than your teacher. But when you get an answer wrong, what's your teacher going to do? He or she's going to tell you, no, that's wrong. Now, they may not laugh at you about it. Hopefully, they won't make a big deal and put a dunce cap on you and all that. But they're going to tell you that's wrong because their job is to help you do it right. And until you know you've done it wrong, you're never going to try to do it different, which is right. You know, and so I may be smarter than my teacher, but I don't have the knowledge that my teacher has. You know, there may, there's people out there that intelligence quotient, you know, man, they're just light years ahead of me. But they don't have the Bible knowledge. And so they need someone, me, someone, to help them understand what God says. And until a person knows they're lost, they're not going to be saved. So, you know, we're not being judgmental. We do this, we make those decisions to be helpful. And it's not fun. It's not fun at all to be studying with someone and talking to them about their soul and reading Scripture and then have them start crying because all of a sudden it hit them that Mama is gone and she is not in heaven like I thought she was all my life. Or grandmother is not where I thought she was because she didn't do what I now understand you have to do. That's not easy. That's hard. But it's part of the conversion process. A person has to understand. And I've had it happen many times. You know, where just start crying and, you know, of course, I'll ask, did I say something wrong? And I know what they're crying about, but, you know, and then I just, but I want them to, Tell me, so I make sure I'm not messing something up. But you know, it's not an easy thing, but it's a necessary thing. Because until a person is convicted of sin, they'll never be convicted of righteousness. Because unless I know 2 plus 2 equals 5 is the wrong answer, I'm never going to come up with any other answer. I'm not going to change my mathematical you know, abilities until I know I'm wrong. Then when I know I'm wrong, I'll get the right answer. But until I know I'm wrong, I'm not going to get the right answer. And the same is true in Scripture, same is true in my relationship with God. And our job, to some degree, we don't go out there, just our primary purpose is not to show people how wrong they are. Our primary purpose is to seek and save the lost, but in doing that, a person has to know they're lost before they're going to look for salvation. As Jesus said right at the very beginning, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness are the ones that are filled not the ones that don't think they're thirsty. They're not, you know, and they're not hungry. They're not going to look for food and water. But when a person learns he's dying of thirst and dying of malnutrition, spiritually speaking, he will turn to God and seek the water and the meat of the truth. But until he knows he's lost, he's not going to do it. So I studied to know how I can answer people's inquiries, questions. Acts chapter 17, 11. Those in Berea were what? More noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? They searched the Scriptures daily to verify what Paul had told them was true. Now, they only had available to them the Old Testament Scriptures. And, of course, Paul, in his time, because of what he was doing in the time of the the way it was, he taught from the Old Testament and to verify, to prove to people that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the promised Messiah and all of that. And so they searched those Old Testament prophecies he talked about so that they could know he was telling them the truth. And God, the Holy Spirit, through Luke says, that is a sign of nobility in God's eyes. That you don't just hook, line, and sink or take what a man says, even if he's an inspired apostle, which no preacher on earth today is, but Paul was an inspired apostle. And the Bereans said, we're going to check him out anyway. And God said, that is noble. Well, I study so I can be noble in the sight of God. Mike?
That's true, because who knows? You know, I mean, having a copy of Scripture back then would have been incredibly unusual because they were written by scribes. Everything, any, any, any copy of Scripture you had at that day and age would have been handwritten. And so very few people had them. And, yeah, or maybe the synagogue. And if Berea probably had a synagogue. And so they had to, and most likely that's where the copy of the Old Testament Scriptures would have been. So they would have had to, you know, go to the synagogue, check it out. But they did that daily. They did that daily to verify, to prove the things they had heard were true. And that's a sign of nobility. John 6, 44 and 45. Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. If I want to know how to be in Christ, it's going to take diligent study. So those are some reasons I study. To properly handle the truth, to fulfill the command to teach, to answer people's questions, to be noble in God's sight, and to know how to be in Christ. Success of necessity in any field, basically. Success requires knowledge. And knowledge requires study, whatever the topic or field of endeavor may be. I need to study the Scriptures. And when I do, I need to understand the separation between the Old and the New Covenants, the Old and New Testament. My study should be diligent, and it ought to be meaningful. <clears throat> Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but what? He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I need to study so that I can know how to go to heaven. That's the bottom line. Faith comes. How? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. John chapter 20, verse 31. You know, I've written these things that in reading them you may believe, and in believing you may find life through his name. It's important. If I want to have faith, I've got to study God's word. Maybe we should put the following on our Bibles. You know, have you get this warning? This book is habit forming. Regular use causes lack of anxiety, decreased appetite for lying, cheating, stealing, and hating. Symptoms. Increased sensations of love, joy, peace, and compassion. And those are things I can have if I'll spend more time in that book. Let me share this with you and then we're done. It's called The Eulogy of the Bible. I've read this, I'm sure, before. Well, I know I did back in, well, at some point in time, because I did this sermon at some point in time. <clears throat> Many years ago, I entered the wonderful temple of God's revelation. I entered the portico of Genesis and walked down through the Old Testament art gallery where the pictures of Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David, and Daniel hung on the wall. I entered the music room of the Psalms where the Spirit swept the keyboard of nature and brought forth the dirge-like wail of the weeping prophet Jeremiah. To the grand impassioned strains of Isaiah until it seemed that every reed and harp in God's organ of nature responded to the tuneful touch of David, the sweet singer of Israel. I entered the chapel of Ecclesiastes, where the voice of the preacher was heard, and passed into the conservatory of Sharon, where the lily of the valley's sweet-scented spices filled and perfumed my life. I entered the business room of the Proverbs, and passed into the observatory room of the prophets, where I saw many telescopes of various sizes, some pointed to far-off events, but all concentrated upon the bright and morning star, which was soon to rise over the moonlit hills of Judea for our salvation. I entered the audience room of the King of Kings and caught a vision from the standpoint of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, entered the Acts of the Apostles, where the Holy Spirit was doing His office work in the forming of the church, passed into the correspondence room where sat Paul, Peter, James, Jude, and John penning their epistles. I stepped into the throne room of Revelation, where all towered into glittering peaks. I got a vision of the king seated upon his throne in all his glory, and I cried, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. I need to study God's word. Next week, Lord willing, we will start looking at, we've talked about some of the differences in, you know, I mentioned 
about how many, most religious groups do not understand the separation of the Old and New Testaments. And so that prompted one of our esteemed class members to think of some other things that may be different between us and denominationalism. And so we'll start looking at that. Next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the idea of you know, the preacher being the pastor and what is right or not, what's right or wrong or whatever with that concept. And we'll look at some scriptures and some thoughts on that. And, uh, and then we'll move on into other things, perhaps where we find some distinction between what's taught in the Lord's Church and what's taught in other religious groups. But anyway, Sam gave me some good ideas, and I do appreciate it. He's done that more than once. And so I take them, as he said, he's batting 500. I took one, I hadn't responded to the second one he gave me, and this is the third one. So you'll be batting 750 after this, hopefully. But anyway, I uh, appreciate your comments, and uh, we'll do that starting next week. And then a week, as you, as you know, in fact, there's a chunk about to fall, um, you know, the ceiling has got to be painted. Those of you who are smarter than I am, how would you paint this ceiling? What are you going to have to do to get up there? Scaffolding. Now, if you come in and set up enough scaffolding to get all the way up there, and then you move it to do the whole ceiling, are you going to take it down until you're through? No, you are not. So, Lord willing, the plan is a week from Monday, February 5th, the first Monday in February, the painters are coming in. They're going to set up their scaffolding that day, and they're going to start on Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock painting. They're thinking it's going to take from Monday of that week through probably Friday of the next week, which means there will be scaffolding in here two Wednesday nights and one Sunday. So we will probably on February the 11th, that Sunday, we will be meeting in the fellowship hall. I would like to say that's a shame because we don't have room for all of us down there, but it's a shame we do have room for us all of us down there. So probably that Sunday we'll meet in the fellowship hall and the two Wednesday nights will do the same. But uh, anyway, that's going to start, Lord willing, February the 5th. So keep that in mind, but it needs to be done. We've had a little paint flex falling for several months, and so they're going to get in here and get that done. Dickie got that all set up. We appreciate that. So that's kind of what's going on around here.